Welcome everyone. Um, it's a little bit dark, so it's hard to see everyone in the audience, but uh, I'm really glad uh, to see everyone out here today. What a, what a wonderful crowd. Uh, my name is Mo. Uh, I'm an engineer at uh, GitLab. I work on the composition analysis team until recently. And today I just wanted to share a story about some of the work that uh, I did at uh, GitLab to help uh, in decrease the size of Docker images. So I'm gonna, gonna tell you a whale of a tale uh, just to get started, a little background on me. I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I've worked at uh, several different types of industries from startup to agency consulting. Uh, I did some information systems in an oil and gas company, uh, security product, and most recently working at uh, GitLab. Okay, enough about me. Let's talk about, uh, let's let me tell you the story. So at GitLab, we have a feature called license scanning. And the idea behind this was uh, customers were saying they wanted to see what dependencies were uh, used in, in their projects and what software licenses were associated with those projects. And so you can think about a typical Rails application that may have dependencies like Rails, which is sourced from Bundler, or if you're using uh, Webpacker, you may have Rails Action Cable, et cetera, that are sourced from Yarn. And each of these dependencies and packages have their own software license that's associated with them. And depending on the type of software that you produce, uh, the licenses that are associated with those dependencies can actually be uh, a legal problem for, for your organization. So we need to find a way to scan software projects of uh, any type. You know, these could be Ruby, Python, Node, uh, Rust, et cetera, projects. And we need to be able to discover the software licenses that are associated with any dependencies on this project. Pretty simple, right? Just the list page. <laughs> uh, get the name, version, package manager license. So I'm going to share some of the, the steps that we took to help uh, solve and work on this problem. So some of the constraints around this problem were that we needed to support multiple versions of different languages, as I mentioned, like .NET Core, NuGet, GoLang, Java, etc. And each of those languages and uh, tool chains also have different package managers. So in the case of Python, there's pip and there's pip end. In the Java ecosystem, there's Gradle, Maven, and more that I probably don't remember off the top of my head. Ruby has Bundler. And so uh, in terms of actually detecting software licenses, it isn't a matter of just uh, reading files. We need to be actually downloading source for those packages and then scanning the source code for the licenses that are embedded with them. So this is a tricky problem because uh, we have no idea what the target project is going to contain, where the lock files or definitions for the software is available. And in some cases, the dependencies have, uh, for example, uh, the Postgres gem has a dependency on libpq, which is a the Postgres uh, libraries that uh, is used for uh, doing the compiling and linking so that it can actually do interop between uh, the Ruby code and the, the C code to interact with uh, Postgres. So some system packages also need to be uh, installed in this environment. And uh, a few other interesting requirements was that this needed to operate in a limited connectivity environment, uh, which meant that we may not have access to the public internet uh, to, to actually download the source code. And so we needed a way to make sure that whatever we're building uh, can work by just taking raw source code and doing its best to understand the software licenses that are associated with any dependencies. And the killer constraint was it must be deployed as a Docker image because <laughs> the Docker images are a self-contained uh, environment that ideally has all the tooling necessary to perform uh, a given function. All right, so, uh, okay, let, let me just get this right. So I, I need to build a Docker image and it's got to scan any code base. It's got to install any number of tools and different versions of those tools. Different versions of those tools also have uh, their own dependencies. So for example, Ruby 2.3 was dependent on a specific version of OpenSSL that is now uh, deprecated and is known to have vulnerabilities, whereas newer versions of Ruby are, are, are dependent on newer versions of OpenSSL. There are some changes there. So not only do I need to be able to detect the software project, but I also need to be able to install a version of Ruby that that project uses, which may also have its own in, uh, indirect dependencies, which are system packages. Uh, we also need to be able to be small enough to fit on a CD-ROM. <laughs> so we, can, we have to ship this thing uh, and so it can work in limited network uh, or limited connectivity environments. So, wow, uh, are you joking? <laughs> that's, that's, okay, okay, let's get started. What, what, what do we do? Where do we start? Okay, let's take a look at like how 
this integration works in the first place. So I'm gonna provide a little bit of context here in terms of this is very focused on how things work at GitLab. So when uh, an author uh, uh, commits code to a branch, this is typically managed in Git. So we use Git as our version control system. We push a commit into a Git. This can be in one of many branches. And when uh, a commit is pushed to a branch, this triggers a downstream pipeline, a pipeline that then is run by the GitLab runner. The GitLab runner takes that code and it attempts to launch a container and mount that code into a volume that that container has access to. And whatever function or uh, script that needs to run in that container is up to that container to decide. The GitLab runner operates with the interface of a launch the container, provide you the code, and the container performs some operation. It has an opportunity to return artifacts that then could be uploaded. It can emit an exit code that says that this operation was successful or not successful, but that's the interface that we're working with. So we commit code, GitLab runner picks that up, launches a container, and when it launches a container, it's, connect it's connecting to one of many different types of Docker hosts. And so in this case, the Docker host then has to decide, do I have uh, the image or the Docker image that this uh, uh, that the GitLab runner is requesting that I launch as a container? And if it doesn't, it then will go and download that uh, image from a Docker registry. And then once it's got the, the Docker image locally, it can then mount uh, that image as a container, uh, attach the, the actual uh, source code as a volume uh, mount point in the container, and then whatever function that needs to occur in that Docker image can occur. So in this case, we're building the license scanner Docker image. So the license scanner Docker image does its best to determine what types of languages or tools this project uses, uh, install any packages that that uh, project uses, and then do a scan of the actual source uh, or metadata associated with those packages to try to determine the software licenses that are associated with that package. From there, it compiles that information together and publishes a report of findings to the GitLab Rails application so that we can display this in the user interface. So there's a lot of moving parts here, a lot of different things that, uh, that we need to consider. So our integration point for the most part is this uh, uh, section down here, the license scanner section. This is, this is where we can, we have control of the runtime environment. We have control of whatever code we want to execute and run. And the interface is again, we're providing the source code and to do whatever analysis we need to. Now, um, the initial version, uh, we, we, we got it working. We shipped a, a Docker image. And in that Docker image was, if I recall correctly, it was a Node.js script that shelled out to a program called License Finder. And uh, the Docker image was based on the uh, License Finder uh, Docker uh, base image. So we inherited, it inherited all the different tools that were available in that Docker image. And then there was a, a tiny shim, which I mentioned was that script that then would uh, shell out to License Finder, take the results, which were admitted as HTML, transform the HTML results into a JSON uh, um, report, and then provide that back as a JSON data back to the Rails application. So there are several different problems associated with, with that original version, but at least we got a working version where we could actually demonstrate, hey, look, we can detect software packages. We can detect their versions, the, the type of package manager that was used, as well as the software licenses associated with that package. Yay, so this is fantastic. We had a, we had a working piece of software. We can detect licenses. Um, but the first feedback is like, cool, but why is it so slow, right? So I'm a developer and I, I'm an impatient developer. When I submit a pull request, merge request, and I have a pipeline kickoff, I want that information as quick as possible because uh, the shorter the feedback cycle, the faster that I can learn and iterate and make decisions that help me move forward to the next decision. The longer that cycle takes, uh, the more painful of an experience it is for me. And I can either uh, lean into the pain and try to fix it or remove it, right? And if uh, and so why is it so slow? We have this thing that's working, it's actually providing some value, but it's taking a really long time. Okay, so let's go back and think about this. Well, uh, in the original architecture, if we focus on this, we have this component, the Docker host, which goes to the registry, it downloads that image, and then it, it launches it, right? Well, when you're running Docker on a local host, or depending on how you run Docker, uh, usually Docker will cache that image locally. So the first, you incur a hit the first time you download the image, and the second time, depending on your pull policy, uh, you, you can launch the image quite quickly as a container because you already have it locally. 
Now, what we found was like in the, the GitLab runtime environment, uh, these hosts, the way they were configured was these images were not cached on a host because they would overwhelm disk space. And so they were downloaded, they were, uh, in, uh, you know, pardon me, they were downloaded, uh, they were launched as a container, they performed some function, and then the image was tossed away. So it was no longer in the local cache. So every single uh, commit produced a pipeline, which then produced uh, a download from the registry, which then came back to the host. Uh, but again, like, where is the problem? How do we know that this is a problem? Okay, well, what happens if a Docker image is too big? This this usually manifests in a few different ways. Like the problems manifest in a few different ways. And one is slow downloads. So it takes more time to download this image. Uh, it takes more space on disk. So you may find that you actually have to increase your disk size or you run out of disk uh, more regularly. And it also consumes more bandwidth. Uh, to download these bits across the wire. You're competing for network traffic and the network is unreliable. So there's several different failure points that can occur with a Docker image that's too big. Uh, so that's not good. Um, okay, so if we go back and we take a look, what actually happened was just to download that original license scanner image, uh, it was taking approximately six minutes. So when a commit would go into Git, uh, Git would trigger the pipeline and a pipeline would run. It would take six minutes to go download that image from the registry before it even started scanning. So remember at scan time, we also have to install tools and source packages, which may be over the public internet. Uh, and so there's a lot more network activity, but just before we even began the scan, it took six minutes just to get to that point. Okay, so that's a bit of a problem. Now, I'm gonna talk about some of the ways that we went about uh, resolving some of the issues. There's still room for improvement, uh, but before I do that, I think it's probably best that I like level set, just go through a few Docker definitions. This isn't going to be a deep dive into Docker so much as just making sure that when I say certain things that we all understand uh, what I'm saying. Okay, so in terms of Docker, there's a few different things uh, we need to clarify. So I've mentioned the terms image and container, and I'm gonna relate these back into Ruby things. So. Uh, on the screen here, I have an example of a class called person. And the person class identifies a couple pieces of behavior and, a, and one piece of data, right? So in this case, a person can hug another person and each person has a name. So these are both behavior and data that's associated with this class person. Now person itself, that class can't really do anything until you create an instance of that person, right? So when we instantiate person, that gives us an object. Ruby's a little, uh, a little on the gray area because you can actually do a lot with the class, but bear with me here. Uh, so once you create an instance of the person class, we now have an instance of that object and objects can interact with each other. They can communicate with each other. They can send messages to each other. And so in the context of Docker, the class would be very much like an image where an image is a description of what's included in the Docker container runtime, uh, what steps, what's, what's available in the image. And then an object is an instance of uh, the class, just like a container is an instance of an image. So we can produce images, ship them, but they don't actually become useful until you create an instance of the image, which is actually a container and running that container. Um, another component that's important is the registry, which I talked about a little bit. And a registry is where you would share your uh, Docker images. So once you've produced an image, we need a way to actually transport and share these images. And so a Docker registry maintains the images themselves, but as well as metadata about the images so that a client or host that's connecting to the registry can uh, figure out whether or not they have the most uh, up-to-date version of an image or if there's a newer image available. So just from a high level, when we talk about Docker, we're really talking about three things, right? There's the command line interface that we're used to using. So if you've ever typed Docker run, Docker exec, Docker, etc. They're usually operating against the, the command line interface, which is the client of a Docker host. All that communication uh, typically operates over a Unix socket file or a, a TCP endpoint. If you're doing Docker in development on a Linux host, uh, you're typically just reading and writing from the var run docker.soc, which is the socket file that the Docker host is listening to. So we've got the command line interface, which is connecting to a Docker host and it's using a HTTP JSON API that's either transported over TCP or uh, Unix socket. Uh, the Docker host itself is what's launching those containers. It manages its own uh, list of images that it knows of and it runs a daemon. 
uh, that uh, takes care of utilizing the uh, Linux container functionality to be able to share the, the host kernel with any uh, containers that are launched. And then the third component, as I mentioned, is the registry where we store and share images. Um, all right, so just a quick example. So in this example, I'm just launching a quick uh, con uh, Docker container. Uh, in this case, I'm launching the Alpine latest container. And so what will happen is that Docker command, which is the CLI, will interact with my uh, local Docker daemon host and say, can you launch this uh, container or this image as a container? And the uh, image that I'm requesting here is Alpine latest. So latest is the actual tag. And what will happen is the host will check to see, okay, do I have this uh, particular image locally? If I don't, then I will go and fetch it from the appropriate location. And because I haven't specified a fully qualified name with a URL in front of it, it defaults to Docker Hub. Uh, once it's downloaded that image to the local do uh, Docker host, it will then uh, attempt to start running it. So it will launch it and apply any network, pardon me, any network or volume settings that you want and, uh, and execute the default entry point or command for that. So in this particular case, the default entry point for Alpine latest, I believe is actually just uh, the born shell. So I'm overriding that by just saying, can you please cast the Etsy OS release so we can see that I'm running this Docker container from my Fedora 32 host uh, and the container itself, when it launches and executes, it says that it's actually an Alpine uh, Linux host. All right, now let's talk about like, how do we build a Docker file? So in terms of defining a Docker file, this is the equivalent of like defining the person class in Ruby. So this is where we're saying, well, I want to I want to create a new Docker image and I'm going to inherit or uh, uh, source it from this base image. So we have to start every Docker file with a uh, starting point. So in some cases, so we're basically saying, what is the base class that I'm inheriting from? Now, unless you're building your own scratch image or uh, or uh, distro list images, uh, it's slightly different in that case. But in this case, we're saying, I wanna build a Docker file and let's start with uh, Alpine latest as my starting point. So whatever happens to be in the Alpine latest image is where we're going to start. On top of that, we're gonna run a few commands. Like we're gonna install Ruby, uh, we're gonna copy a file called hello.rb and just mount it from my host. We're gonna copy from my host hello.rb and put it in a location inside the uh, container or in the image uh, known as user local bin hello. I'll make that file executable. And as the default command, uh, we'll make the hello command the default action or the default thing that runs whenever you launch that particular image as a container. So if I just run this, if I build this image and I run it, um, we'll, we'll be able to see. So here I've taken that same Docker file, we've built it, and we can see that each line in the file is a separate step. And if you look closely, you'll see this uh, identifier that uniquely identifies that line or the, the output of that line or what was included in that line. So step one, step two, step three, four, and five. And then finally, we have a final container or image, pardon me, with, with an ID. And we've successfully built that, that particular Docker image. Now, if we want to run it, um, because I've already given it a, a, a human-friendly name, developing with Docker latest, I could run it. And we can see that it's actually just doing exactly as I wanted. It's printing uh, hello world.rb. It didn't quite show you the contents of that Ruby file, but it was just put as hello world. All right, so now, now we have an idea of like, how do we build a Docker image? And, uh, and, and, and so what does that mean? Now that we've got to build a Docker image, how do I know what's in it and how do I optimize it? And this is where we can start to do a little bit of analysis on the Docker image. So each Docker image is just a set of layers and each layer is really a snapshot of the file system and whatever changes occurred in that layer from, uh, that's different from the previous layer. So it's like a differential snapshot uh, of each layer. And the contents of that layer uh, uh, can increase in size, but it doesn't really decrease the overall size of the image. So for example, if you add one file in one layer, the top layer here, let's say we're adding a file uh, called three cheese. And then in this following subsequent layer, we then remove that file. Well, we still incur the cost of adding that file in the first place. And then the removing of that file doesn't really decrease the overall size because you are uh, taking the aggregate of each snapshot uh, from each layer uh, in the Docker file. So knowing that uh, a Docker image is a set of layers uh, comes with some intuition that tells us, well, 
we actually need to optimize every layer in the Docker image in order for us to have an optimal Docker image and saving cleanup at the end uh, doesn't actually optimize the image that in a way that we might traditionally think uh, when we're building other parts or other types of uh, artifacts. All right, so let's let's dive in a little bit into, into Docker here, into these Docker layers. So uh, there's a great tool called Dive and uh, this tool actually allows you to visually inspect and look at each layer in a Docker image. And this is fantastic because that uh, the, the text user interface that it provides you allows you to see each, each layer and then drill down into specific layers to actually see which files were added, which files were removed and et cetera. So you can see this is at the very top here, I've got the original Docker file and each line in that Docker file. And in the bottom half of the screen, you'll see how it corresponds to a specific layer in the final uh, Docker image. So at the very top, we've got from Alpine latest. And then uh, in the actual layers, we can see that that Alpine latest actually cost us about 5.6 megabytes just for that layer. So this is like a compressed archive file, uh, which represents the layer. Now, the next command that we ran was add APK Ruby. And we can see that just by, pardon me, add APK add Ruby. By adding Ruby, we've actually just increased uh, the size of the image by 16 megabytes. It's this one layer has about 16 megabytes of, of files that were introduced or added. And, and this is what's causing a bit of a bloat. So in terms of like op analyzing an image, is if you look at each layer uh, using something like dive, you can see, okay, which layers are the thickest? And, and maybe like, uh, and then now we can dive in even further to see why, what is that 16 megabytes? Where is that coming from? What is it introducing? What types of files are being added? Do we really need each of these files? Do I need all these default configuration files if I'm building a very highly specialized Docker image for a specific scenario? You know, do I need all the default files or configuration that comes from uh, a standard Ruby package that ships with Alpine? because that package was designed for general use cases and not necessarily my specialized use case. All right, so we can see that there's a hotspot in this image. It's about 16 megabytes. And so the next thing is we can actually just drill down into that, that particular layer. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of taking snapshots from the text user interface. Uh, so bear with me, the actual program itself, it's much more friendlier to look at and work with. And I sort of removed certain things that, uh, to make this a little bit easier. But this is actually uh, looking at the contents of that particular layer, that previous 16 megabyte uh, layer, which where we added Ruby. And we can see here that 14 megabytes was added to the user folder. And from here, we can drill down further and further and we can see what files are actually being added. Um, and, and, do we, and we can critically analyze, do we need these files for our final Docker image? You know, Ruby by default ships with things like SDM as well as uh, uh, coverage and a few other tools that you may not necessarily need for your usage of Ruby. So you can actually unpack that uh, Ruby APK, install the pieces of Ruby that you need, and either remove the items you don't need or clean it up, but at least we can at least identify what files are being introduced and critically analyze whether or not uh, we, we want those changes. All right. Um, so let's go back uh, to license scanner version 1.0. So, well, how many layers did it have? You know, because uh, like as I mentioned, the first version of license scanner was a script that shelled out to a program called License Finder, and we were using the base image that was provided by License Finder. So, if we analyze that original uh, uh, Docker image, we can see that there's several layers. Each line in here, where we're saying pull complete, pull complete, or download complete, represents a separate layer that's downloaded at the time that uh, the Docker host is pulling the registry. So when the Docker host is asked to uh, launch an image that it doesn't have and it fetches that image from the Docker registry, it does this in pieces, right? So it's actually downloading one layer at a time. And you can tweak the concurrency level so that it can actually download these things in parallel, but each layer has a cost. And uh, the more layers you have, the longer it takes. You can see that at the very bottom, we're actually, we're just waiting to even start downloading a bunch of those layers. Some of the layers have been completed and as each layer is downloaded, it then uh, extracts the contents of that layer, but it has to happen in a specific order. You couldn't actually take the last layer and extract that before you finished extracting the first layer. So even though we can download in parallel, we can't exactly extract and unpack those layers uh, until we've actually got the layers before it. So it has to be done sequentially, even though the downloads can be done in parallel. 
So the original uh, Docker uh, image that we were shipping had many, many layers, many large layers. So when we take a look at those layers, we can see, okay, what are some things that we can do to actually improve the size of the image? And one of the things you can do is just take a look at the base image that you're using. If you're choosing a base image that's quite friendly in terms of usage because it's it just has everything you you want and you don't have to worry about it, uh, sometimes it comes with additional bloat that you also don't need. So in this particular case, because we were using the license binder uh, base image, uh, which started at a size of 6.21 gigabytes, uh, anything we did could only uh, would always be limited by that six gigabytes, right? That's the minimum that we could have in terms of a Docker image. And so just by choosing a different Docker image, we can significantly decrease the size of our Docker image. If there might be trade-offs um, to consider, for example, by going from the license finder image to a Debian stable image, we still have the ability to use apt get because apt is a the default package manager that's uh, that comes with Debian and the license finder image itself used Ubuntu as its base image and Ubuntu uses is a, a, um, a derivative of Debian. So we just skipped a bunch of different <laughs> layers in the lineage and just went straight to the source. And so we went from 6.21 gigabytes down to 69 megabytes. Um, and we took more responsibility of the uh, layers in between uh, that were provided by Ubuntu and that license binder image uh, by, by tuning just the things that we needed. So that was a massive decrease in size just by choosing a better base image. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is just like to be a little bit more picky about the things you, you use and install. It's pretty easy to get into this uh, copy paste uh, scenario where you go to a web page and it says, okay, this is how you install Node. Let me just copy the curl script and install Node.js and it'll just set things up for me. Um, but you, you should consider the fact that those tools, the way that those packages are generated is meant for general use cases. So they're typically shipped with a bunch of additional bloat that you might need for development, but not necessarily for production usage. So in this particular case, we were in that this is right out of the Docker file from License Finder. Uh, we were installing multiple tools from multiple locations, and you can see that each uh, run would correspond to a separate layer in the Docker image. And some of those layers aren't actually cleaning up after themselves. A lot, in fact, I think all of these layers are just blindly downloading things and then not actually doing any form of cleanup to see if there's things that can be removed or optimized. Uh, in some cases, we're downloading things from sources that I'm not sure who owns them and we're not doing any sort of uh, verification to see, are these Debian packages trusted? What's actually the contents of those Debian packages? Are they safe to use, et cetera? So I, uh, the point here I wanna make is be picky. You know, When you do install a package, take a look at what's in it and consider whether or not it's offering you more than you need. Sometimes uh, installing meta packages will actually include, it will have dependencies of their own and it'll install a whole bunch of other packages and some of them you may not need. And so you can actually just trim down the size of your image by being picky as to which specific packages you need for your Docker image. Uh, um, and trusting in the base package system for the most part, I think is safe. But once you start jumping out of that and using third party uh, locations, just uh, be considerate of the fact that it might be secure today, but you need to think about how it's gonna be secure tomorrow and the day after. And, and whether or not you actually need these tools. Some of the tools that are there might be nice to have for development, but aren't necessarily uh, necessary for uh, production runtime. And so you could consider actually removing those for the final hardened image. Um, so in this particular case, just grouping together a set of app get installs by doing something like just extract all of that out into a install.sh script. So do all your installations in a file and have a, a single layer that copies that install.sh file and then a single layer to run that. That way you don't have to incur the cost of multiple layers for downloading packages from multiple different places. And you can actually get into the habit of actually doing the cleanup in one way, extracting functions for doing the cleanup. A lot of the base Docker images nowadays have uh, uh, handlers that typically clean up uh, .deb from bar cache or .apk. So like those transient uh, artifacts that are typically downloaded in order to 
download and install packages are now usually cleaned up, but it doesn't hurt to take a look to see if there's other things that are missing and can be removed. So rip your installs together, just install that SH. Um, an additional optimization uh, that we made in this particular case was to utilize uh, compression outside of the compression that Docker was using to compress each archive. Now, each uh, layer is converted to an archive file, which then is gzipped. So within the Docker image itself, we chose to use uh, Z standard, which is a, a project that came out of Facebook with a, uh, a tuning the compression level to different levels. So in this case, we're tuning it to a level 19 and we're using as many threads as are available to actually do the compression. So once we've identified it, uh, in this Docker image, there were several folders that are actually quite large that we actually did need to include at that time uh, we were able to shrink the size of some of the layers by just to, in, like introducing our, our own compression. So we compressed these folders, in this case, like the ASDF folder, we compressed it into a Z standard folder. Uh, and then uh, at, at runtime, what we would do is we would uh, decompress or inflate those files. So what that does is like it creates a very small layer uh, or very small image, which makes it a little bit more efficient for transport the cost comes at build time because building takes longer to do a, a very thorough compression. However, the decompression is almost constant time because of the, the decompression algorithm that's used by Z standard, uh, Z standard or Z standard. Um, so choosing a good uh, compression algorithm as well as tuning that compression can yield benefits in the size of the Docker image itself and can be almost uh, like negligent in terms of the cost that it incurs at runtime. So in this case, at build time, we were compressing files and folders that were large. And then at runtime, uh, we hijacked the entry point so that the first thing that would happen is we would take those files that were necessary for the program to run and we would decompress them. Uh, again, using near constant time decompression, this was negligible in terms of the cost of downloading a larger image versus incurring a tiny uh, bit of a cost at boot time for that container image to be able to decompress uh, those large directories. And then we just forwarded the actual original command uh, down to the default uh, form shell here. So this was a way to provide an image that you know, worked transparently to end users, uh, but was it, handling its own compression internally for certain files and folders that were large. And then uh, another step we took even further was just taking ownership of the Debian packages that we were dependent on. So in this particular case, license scanning was dependent on, you know, uh, scanning project types that we don't even know. So there's multiple versions of Ruby out there and there's multiple versions of Bundler. Uh, if you take a look at the default uh, Ruby packages that you get from your package manager, they do include a lot of bloat, but there's a lot of ways that you can produce a minimal uh, omnibus uh, Ruby package that's self-contained that includes all the dependencies it needs, including CLIB. Uh, I can't remember the other, the other two or three packages that it depends on, uh, but also removing a lot of bloat, like our doc for the most part is quite big. Uh, our doc includes a lot of image files and text heavy files that for the most part, we don't need at runtime. We don't need the R doc documentation. So in this particular case, we used, uh, a project from Chef called uh, Chef Omnibus to build uh, Omnibus Debian packages, as I mentioned, that had all the system dependencies that they depended on. So I talked about earlier, Ruby had a dependency on an older version of OpenSSL, Ruby 2.3 that is, had a dependency on an older version of OpenSSL. Well, when we built these Docker or these Debian packages, we could actually include that specific version of OpenSSL as part of the Omnibus Debian package. And because of this at runtime, when we detect a specific version of Ruby, instead of going out to the internet and downloading the latest Ruby tarball and compiling from source using a version manager like ASDF, RVM or RVM, we were able to just unpack a pre-compiled Debian package that already had everything we needed. And these worked out to about five megabytes per uh, Ruby version, which is um, still fairly big, but it could be smaller. Like uh, this was actually a, a pretty big savings in terms of uh, the default Ruby size, I think was a couple of 20-ish or so megabytes. So um, that was a, a pretty uh, decent optimization. And finally, like what were the results? Okay, so you, you shared a few highlights. My, well, we went like this. Well, we started with license scanner version 1.5 was actually at around four gigabytes. 
when we upgraded to uh, license scanner uh, version 2.0 where we introduced some backwards uh, uh, changing breaking features, we also updated it so that it points it was using the latest version of license finder and that was license finder 6.0 and it had just continued to add more and more bloat into their docker image which bubbled the image size up to about 9.83 gigabytes. Remember this is 9.83 gigabytes as a compressed, uh, each layer was compressed and this is what it, it is just a transport across network before you unpack it and actually mount it as a Docker uh, container. And from the 9.83, we got it down to 1.4 gigabytes, but also added support for multiple versions of multiple tools and added more and more features and made it uh, work in an offline environment. So there's still room to grow in terms of shrinking the size of the Docker image, but uh, these are some of the lessons that uh, I learned from working on this project. And I hope some of this information was useful to you. Um, the main summary, I guess, is try to keep each layer small. You know, uh, The first step is to understand uh, why the Docker image is big. And that usually comes in the form of analysis, understanding that each layer has a cost. Keep each layer small. Uh, try to group install steps together. And if there's a way that you can actually clean up uh, residual artifacts that might be part of those installs that you don't need, do it in that install step. So I recommend just creating an install.sh. Uh, clean up transient artifacts in each layer. As I mentioned, a lot of the later uh, newer Docker base images do some of that cleanup automatically, uh, just as part of taking, like hooking into different configuration files for apt get and RPM, et cetera. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to also look to see if there's additional things that you know you can remove that uh, you know the base images can't determine because you under you have the context and understanding of your own Docker images and what things are necessary at runtime. And then as um, as a sort of like uh, advanced technique, consider measuring uh, the cost of deflating and inflating files. So include your own compression and decompression. And remember, there's a trade-off because it's a CPU hit as well to do that compression and decompression. But choosing a good algorithm and tuning it to the certain level can actually yield uh, benefits. So it's like minor cost to runtime, but a significant savings in uh, download time. And that's all I have for today. So <laughs> thanks for having me. And I was wondering, like uh, you, as far as I understand, you've done all this analysis like by like manually, but maybe there are any like tools in the wild to do it automatically? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. I know that Dive has a dash dash CI uh, option. I haven't explored that to see what I can do with it. So, um, you know, one of the things that I have done is just including jobs to do a check to see what is the size of the Docker image. Uh, so one of the things I added was a job just to actually download a fresh image and make sure that it was under a certain amount of time. So like three minutes, I think was the cutoff at one point. Another one was to actually uh, download the image, take a look at the size of the image and then compare it against a, a minimal version size. So I'm still targeting a CD-ROM. And so those types of checks are now part of the pipeline and as jobs as part of the license uh, scanner uh, uh, project, as, as you can see. And I'm happy to show you <laughs> afterwards if you like. So those checks are in, so at least we don't exceed a certain size now that we've hit a certain threshold. So any changes that we make, we can see. Uh, but there's probably things that we could do to improve uh, the CI CD pipeline in terms of creating a visibility. Because once you've broken you know, that threshold or you've exceeded that threshold, the next step is like it's on the author to figure out how to decrease it. So that's where I'd love to get something like Dive or a tool that can actually visually show you, here's all the layers that are quite large and maybe even like um, set a, a minimum uh, or a maximum size per layer as opposed to the entire Docker image. And that way you can see which layer is expensive and focus your energy that way. Uh, like just like a good test helps you identify defect quickly. It gives you good quick uh, defect isolation. I'd like to get that same level of granularity for Docker building, um, but I haven't invested enough time aside from just checking the size of the full Docker image and the time to download on the uh, GitLab network. And network speeds differ, so that's a um, that's that's an, another thing to consider. Sorry, I hope that answers your question, Tatiana. Yeah, yeah, sure, it's answer. Thanks. I have a small question. Hey. I, I missed the point. Why do we introduce those steps with uh, deflating and inflating? Is it because the, 
as I understand, images should be already compressed, yes, but is it some problem with default compression? Yeah, so the default compression uses uh, gzip. So gzip is a compression algorithm, but um, in itself, it, it isn't the most optimal algorithm and you don't have a lot of options in tune for tuning that. Oh, so I actually cannot found, tune them, yes, of course. Yeah, so the tuning part is the difficult part that I couldn't do. Whereas within the build step itself, I could tune it. I could measure, uh, here's a good tuning level. Here's the cost in terms of uh, build time to actually compress these large directories. And then on top of that, it would gzip compress the those compressed uh, layers. So I got a massive savings just by introducing uh, Z standard. I don't it's recommend additional this. Additional question like, was how much do we save with introducing additional steps? Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I can share the the merge request and the numbers were were, were written out in the merge request as the savings for uh, the actual savings in the layers as well as a download cost. Uh, I so I'll share that uh, as soon as I can find the, the merge request. Okay, thank you. How faster? Uh, the pipeline appeared to be with, with this size reduction. Yeah, great question. So uh, I'm going to get you some numbers here. Let's just go to gitlab.com. Hopefully you can see my screen. So let's go to gitlab.com, uh, gitlab or gitlab. And let's just take a look at the most recent pipeline here. And so if you go to the pipelines tab, I think there's still lots of room for improvement, by the way, uh, because there's several layers that I think we could remove by just offering uh, Debian package hosting as one of the features in GitLab. So I can go to, let's say the most recently passed pipeline. And you can see we've got the licenses tab that's lighting up, which means the pipeline job passed. So the output of the actual license scan job is for the most part is this content here. And in terms of the actual time it took, uh, you can see the license scanning job there, uh, job. So GitLab is actually a pretty big code base, but we can see this one took 16 minutes in total. So in terms of actual download time, we're down to about two to three minutes from six. So it's still, it's still large for download. But total time for uh, scan, download, uh, uh, package de uh, license detection, we're looking at 16 minutes for gitlab.com, which has a pip file, yarn.lock file, gemfile.lock, um, lots of room for improvement still. <laughs> and uh, one more question. Sure. Why, why you do not have this serve something like online service when it is always works and you only send like code base to analyze and receive the response. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I was working within the constraints of what we have. GitLab operates as a, as a monolith and they distribute both to the public cloud, which is gitlab.com, but also a self-managed version. So the self-managed version is sort of the money maker for GitLab. So that's one of the constraints is that if you do start to build a new service, um, you have to get buy-in first to do that. And then you have to do uh, quite a bit of work, I think, to get it into the uh, self-managed distribution. So I don't have a lot of experience in terms of service extraction or building at GitLab. I can say from previous organizations that having the opportunity to build this as a service uh, would have been uh, a slightly more optimal in, in my opinion, but that's, that's a different conversation, I think. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. So the question is like, why? Um, I, I, because, because reasons. Yeah, yeah, am I right? Is it, it will download that image and deploy everything on every build? Stack? Yes, yeah, yeah. So there are some um, things that I'm looking to optimize was to actually take advantage of the GitLab CI uh, cache as well. So as part of the license scanning job, now all the packages are being installed to a specific .gitlab slash cache directory. That directly currently isn't being cached as part of the GitLab cache. So there was one optimization. So that would speed up the time to actually install packages. So if packages aren't changing, we can uh, like load the cache, see that no packages are different. The scan results should be the mo for the most part the same. If the content of uh, the package files haven't changed from the previous scan, uh, that would be useful information if we could maintain state. Uh, at this point, the jobs are run as like a transient job, which we I don't have as any sort of state in terms of like 
what was the difference between this and the last one from the position of this analyzer. Now, the Rails application ha could have a little bit more intelligence in terms of doing that. So I think the questions you're asking is less technical, more political, in, in my opinion. So those are actual fundamental shifts in terms of uh, reorganizing how projects are, are built. Um, I, I don't know that there is one way or another, uh, given the constraints of this particular problem and what was asked, this is the current setting. But I think uh, what you're highlighting is that having a stateful service or something that can maintain state between runs can actually produce something, uh, can produce results that are faster. Because a lot of the times, if the packages aren't changing, the definitions aren't changing, we're incurring the 60 minute cost for really the same result as a previous pipeline. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay.